Hello, and welcome to Portfolio Matters Share Talk. In today's episode, we will be discussing the London listed mid cap oil exploration and production company, Jade Stone Energy, where, full disclosure, I have a large position. It's one of my top 10 holding positions. But before we get into it, I will read the disclaimer. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. Jade Stone Energy is a company that specializes in acquiring mid to late life assets in Southeast Asia from other larger oil companies and extending their the lives of those assets. And it has old school management that I like. In some way, we're going to be saying that I like this company. It's got um, old school, no nonsense management who are very experienced. Paul Blakely, I think, has been in this industry for 47 years. So Jade Stone acquire mid to late life assets from other larger oil companies and aim to extend the life of those assets. But they managed to buy those assets astonishingly cheaply. If we think of the recent last year acquisition of Malaysian assets from Sapura OMV. OMV is the Austrian oil company. The deal was announced in April with the effective date being the 1st of January. So when the deal finally closed in August, Jade Stone received all the accumulated revenues for the um, Malaysian assets for the period since the 1st of January. And that meant actually, instead of paying money to Sapura OMV, Sapura OMV effectively paid them to take the assets off their books. And that added 6,000 barrels a day to Jade Stone. So a lot of these, these assets they're acquiring, if they can do similar deals, and that is an open question given the stronger oil market now, although in its most recent webinar, the company stated it was in six data rooms and was seeing lots of opportunities. So perhaps there are more opportunities available, which would be great for Jade Stone. If it can build a portfolio like that, then this is both a growth and a value company. And what I also really like about Jade Stone is they haven't hedged. So you know, the management really understand what investors are looking for in an oil e &P, and they are fully exposed to a rising oil price. And we'll go through a calculation of 2022 earnings. And in fact, we'll go through two separate calculations and we estimate that they're on a forward PE ratio of about 4.3 at $100 oil. Now, before I continue, I would particularly like to thank members of our Discord channel, particularly Uncool Tom, for helping with this and saving me from some fairly basic errors. And also to Simon W. And thank you to both of you. Okay, so this is the share price. Share price collapsed from the best part of 100 pence to what's that, 32p during COVID. And let's go through the share price history. Okay, so it was only listed in London in 2018, following a, uh, placing $110 million, which they used to buy Montara. We'll go through all their assets shortly. Montara is offshore Australia. And then in late 2019, remember that date, they acquired the Mari oil field 
offshore New Zealand for, from OMV for 50 million with an effective date of the 1st of January, 2019. Now, they still haven't received authority from the New Zealand government to, for that transfer from OMV to Jadestone to be formalized, to be um, allowed. And we'll go through the reasons for that. But in their most recent webinar, Jadestone reiterated the commitment of both OMV and Jadestone to the transaction and said that both sides were lobbying the New Zealand government to try and expedite the transaction. Now, the share price peaked at a price of 93p in January 2020 when crude was trading at $68. The share price is now 100p, but crude, Brent crude, is 110. So I think there is potentially substantial upside here. In the meantime, the company has acquired Malaysian assets, although Mari is still not complete, although the revenues of Mari continue to accrue to Jade Stone. Okay, now in March 2020, due to low oil and gas prices, they delayed plans to develop the Nandu and Yumin gas fields offshore Vietnam. Now they're actually awaiting ministerial approval for that development, which we will go into. Then in April 2020, they delayed the Stag and Montara infill drilling campaigns. They have since done some infill drilling at Montara. And later this year, they will be doing more some infill drilling and Stag. Then in June 2020, they acquired some gas fields onshore Indonesia. The Akatara gas field they're hoping to do the final investment decision in H2 this year. So that is one of their big um, growth development plans. Now, this is interesting. In July 2020, they took legal action against Taikoku Oil over a sale of a 30% interest in an offshore block Vietnam, which Taikoku unilaterally terminated this agreement in 2018. Now, in November 2020, they settled in court, but no significant award of cash was made to JSE. So there is always the danger that when they do these deals, the seller backs out as oil price rises or circumstances change. And the precedent set with the Taikoku oil transaction is the seller appears to be able to back out of these deals without too much of a penalty. Okay, then in April last year, they acquired these Malaysian assets, 6,000 barrels a day, 90% oil for Sapura OMV for $9 million. I mean, these are astonishingly no, low numbers. And then the acquisition completed in August 2021 with Sapura OMV essentially paying Jadestone 9.2 million to take it off their hands. Absolutely amazing deals. Hence, I like Jadestone. Um, then in July, 2021, you had um, an announcement that the Indonesian government have allocated the gas from the Mang to subsidiary of the um, National Electricity Company facilitating the development of Akatara. In September 21, you had Montoa H6, that's offshore Australia, well brought on stream. Long-term flows expect to be about 3,000. Um, November acquired the remainder of Le Mang, 10% it did known. Um, and recently, they have fully restored production at Montara following the failure of an engine in a gas injector. And listening to the CEO, the, um, they keep a full set of spares 
at their facilities in Australia for just this sort of eventuality, which shows, to my, my mind, the uh, benefits of having very experienced management. Okay, bottom line from going through the, the history is, apart from the Taikoku oil litigation, there are no nasties. Okay, let's go through some assets. So all their assets are in Southeast Asia. The Philippines assets were exploration assets and they have handed those licenses back. They then have licenses offshore Vietnam, offshore Malaysia. Those are geographically quite close to each other. Then we have onshore Indonesia, offshore Australia. Those are old and producing assets, the main producing assets of the company. And then in New Zealand, you have the Maori oil field, which is still subject to ministerial approval. Okay, so this is the portfolio overview. The main production assets are offshore Australia, then offshore Malaysia. Now, they're Indonesian assets. This OK field, I know nothing about and is not listed on the company website as being a current asset. So I can't find anything about it. Lemang, subject to final investment decision later in the year. Vietnam, again, these development assets, we will go through them. Now, as we go through this review, the, the bottom line is they're buying these midlife and old oil fields. And generally, the sellers aren't selling their best fields. You would be unsurprised to learn. So um, let's start off with the production assets and start off with STAG. It's heavy oil field offshore Australia. And this is where Stag is, offshore Western Australia. It's 100% owned by Jade Stone. It has 2P reserves of 13.7 million barrels. These are numbers from the last annual report, December 2020. And it's got heavy sweet crude, i.e. low sulfur. And it trades at a $12.7 premium to Brent. And that's as of the last interims in January. So with Brent trading at the best part of 110 this morning, Jade Stone are making very good money out of that field. And production averaged 2,359 barrels per day in 2021. But Jade Stone have two infill wells planned in 2022, plus six well workovers. And they are aiming to boost production from STAG in the second half. Okay, so this is STAG. And you can see, even on a sunny day, the rig looks a bit of a rusting old wreck. And this is the production history, as shown by OffshoreTechnology.com. So... And this is the typical production profile you expect to see of assets that Jade Stone acquired, i.e. long past peak. And so Jade Stone then attempt to essentially extend the life and production of these fields. So the Stag Heavy oil field has recovered about 88.7% of its total recoverable reserves with a peak production of around 23,000 barrels a day in 2000. Now bear in mind, last year was producing around a tenth of that. But on current economic consumption, production will continue for many years yet, for another 25 years. But Stag was responsible for an oil spill of around 600 litres of heavy oil in 2020, when Jade Stone was the operator. What appears to have happened is Jade Stone changed the offtake arrangements for STAG. And in the initial phase of the new arrangement, a marine breakaway coupling in the import floating hose assembly activated. And anyway, there was an oil spill. And these are the new offtake arrangements at STAG. 
So the offtake tamper tanker is here. And later this year, they will be doing two infill wells to try and access unswept oil. But we don't really have an, a forecast for how much that will increase production. Moving on to Montara, which is also offshore Australia. And again, Northwest Australia. It's 100% owned by Jade Stone and is acquired for 195 million in July 2018 and composes three separate fields Montara, Skewer, and Swift slash Swallow. Had 2P reserves of 23.6 million. That's December 2020. So again, 15 months ago. And it produces light sweet crude that trades at a premium of $3.70 to Brent. And in 2021, Montara averaged 7,700 barrels a day. So much bigger than Stag. And there'll be no major upgrades to Montara in 2022. But Montara has a bad environmental history. In 2009, Montara was responsible for the largest oil spill in Australian history. The leak occurred right down underneath the seabed. This was when the um, field was owned by PTTEP, who sold it to Jade Stone. And in a month, the spill had covered an area of 6,000 square meters, around 170 kilometers off the coast of Western Australia. It was eventually fixed by drilling a relief well. Um, but, but the livelihoods of 10,000 Indonesian fishermen was affected as contamination caused a huge drop in fish stocks. And this is a story from November 2020, which reported problems with the Skewer 11 well, following er earlier problems with Skewer 10. So this is a field not without its difficulties. Okay, moving on to the Maori oil field offshore New Zealand. So Maori is owned 69% by OMV and Jadestone is aiming to acquire that 69%. Horizon Oil owns 26% and Q Taranaki owns 5%. And those minor holdings will remain. We say production began in February 2009 i.e. 12 years ago, and the field is currently producing about 4,600 barrels a day from eight production wells. So Jay's then agreed to buy Ma uh, OMV's stake in Maui in November 2019 with an effective date of the 1st of January 2019 for 50 million. Now we will go through this in some depth later, but essentially since 1st of January 2019, the Profits from Mali have been accumulating for Jadestone. And we calculate that OMV will now owe Jadestone money, at least 25 million by our calculation. And this is the Mali platform. And in 2016, the oil field was closed down when a crack was discovered in one of its 12 horizontal struts. Now, why has Jade Stone's acquisition of Mari been held up for so long? Well, this is a Greenpeace article from the 19th of November 2020. And in it, they discuss this. This is the Tui oil field offshore New Zealand, which was acquired also from OMV by Tamarind Resources, but via a subsidiary of Tamarind Resources called Tamarind Taranaki Limited. And just like Jadestone, Tamarind Taranaki were aiming to extend the life of the Tui oil field by doing some infill drilling. But essentially, they failed. They suffered from a dry hole and 
cost overruns. So with the result that Tamarind Resources placed Tamarind Taranaki into administration. That was a big problem for the New Zealand government because with Tamarind Taranaki in administration, the New Zealand government was left on the hook for the decommissioning of the Tui oil field. And that's cost them around $349 million. So they're very keen that Jade Stone should not be permitted to walk away from Maori decommissioning. And reading the press in New Zealand, Jade Stone is being portrayed as a small scavenger oil company that aims to cut OPEX costs to the bone and as a company that is entirely capable of attempting to leave the decommissioning costs with um, the New Zealand taxpayer. In order to force oil companies to pay for the decommissioning of their oil fields, in December 2021, New Zealand passed the Crown Resources Act, and they're now applying that retrospectively to Jade Stone's deal to acquire Mali, which is still waiting approval from the uh, Petroleum and Minerals Ministry. And that act will make it more explicit that oil and gas companies are responsible for decommissioning assets and introduces penalties for failure. But also, it states that companies that sell a license remain responsible for its decommissioning in perpetuity. So were OMV to sell Mari to Jade Stone, if Jade Stone failed to pay for the decommissioning, Mari would then be on the hook in succession and tougher tests for permit acquisitions have been introduced. But both Jade Stone and OMV have reiterated their commitment to the deal. So we can but wait and see. Frankly, Jade Stone currently have 117 million in cash. Both sides committed to this deal. I am sure if the right financial commitments are made, that Jade Stone should be able to get this through, deal through. The alternative would be that New Zealand force OMV to keep running the field when they frankly don't really want to. Is that something that New Zealand really want to achieve? surely it would be better to transfer ownership to a company that values the asset rather than one who doesn't. Okay, moving on to Malaysia. So these were the assets that were acquired last year from Sapura OMV. Produce around 6,000 barrels a day, 90% oil, reserves of 12.5 million. So these were substantial additions to the company portfolio. And here they are. We are going to concentrate on PM329 and PM323. The one in the middle, they have a 50% non-operated stake in, and frankly, they don't talk much about. Now, when we go through management, Paul Blakely spent a lot of time at Talisman Energy, where he was head of Asia. And these Malaysian assets are close to former talisman acreage, so they claim to know this area of the world very well. And these wells first started producing in 2008 for East Belmont and Chermin Gat, and 2010 for West uh, Belmont. But these are not easy fields. So East Belmont was first discovered in 1970 by a big international oil company and then it drilled a further three wells in 1990s, but then abandoned the license, believing the field was uneconomic because it had a very thin oil column, only about 15 meters and viscous oil, and they estimated the recovery rate would be less than 10%. 
The field was acquired by Supera OMV in 2005 and first saw in 2008. And production has massively exceeded expectations. Initial recovery was meant expected to be less than 20 million barrels, but by 2015, they had recovered in excess of 65 million barrels. And Jade Stone is planning an infill drilling campaign for East Belmont in H2 2023. Now, moving to the PM329 uh, license area, this looks like a very good asset. Now, this chart is from Offshore Technology and purports to show the production power profile of East Piatu, which is 70% owned by Jade Stone, but sadly, I just think, I think it's wrong. Essentially, all of um, Jade Stone's Malaysian assets produce a total of 6,000 barrels a day, and that is incompatible with this decline chart. Now, one thing that is of concern regarding the Malaysian assets is the fiscal regime. So, so this is from the Jade Stone presentation on their acquisition of the Malaysian assets, and it shows essentially Government takes 45%, Jade Stone takes 55 But, and thank you to Uncle Tom for pointing this out, there's also this supplementary tax applied on unused cost recovery and profit share when actual prices exceed base price, tax levied at 70%. Now, we don't know what the base price is, but there is a clear danger that as oil prices have risen strongly, so the tax take starts to creep towards 70%, which would be unpleasant for Jade Stone. So there's a danger the tax rate rises now. And now let's look at its development assets. So it's got assets in Vietnam, offshore Vietnam, block 51 and block 4607. They contain gas fields, Nam Du and Yu Min, are the ones that Jade Stone is currently aiming to develop. Tho Chu, it's aiming to develop later. Now it's currently waiting for approval of the field development plans from the Vietnamese government. And these are big fields. So this, is, this chart is from Offshore Technology and it shows the expected production profile of Yu Min, and starting in January 2024, we wish. So that would peak at the best part of 12,000 barrels of oil equivalent a day. And if you look at Nam Du, again, this is a big field. Production will peak close to 12,000 barrels of oil equivalent a day. Although offshore technology have it penciled in the start date of January 2023, which just ain't gonna happen, sadly but it shows that both these two fields are substantial and would greatly add to the production profile of the company. So between them, Nam Du and Yu Min have gas reserves of 171 billion cubic feet, plus liquid reserves of 1.6 million barrels. And Jade Stone owns 100% of both fields, having bought out Petro Vietnam in 2017. Uh, heads of agreement for sale of all the hydrocarbons from both fields have signed with Petro Vietnam back in 2019. Both fields are about 200 kilometers offshore Vietnam, but close to an existing pipeline from a heritage field from Tasman that is in decline. And the company believes there should be enough spare capacity in that pipeline to take the gas from the fields. And the pipeline goes to a power and fertilizer complex onshore Vietnam. But Jade Stone have submitted a failed development plan for both fields as of April 2019, i.e. two years ago, but are yet to have received approval. So these fields seem to be moving ahead very slowly. But as Simon W points out on the Discord, 
Um, Vietnam is a communist country, which has you know, the usual five year plans. And only in 2021 did it pass a law permitting private electricity generation. So his view is not that development has stalled, just that development is moving ahead very slowly. Well, let's hope he's right. But so we just don't know the uh, time scale for the development of these fields, essentially. But you would hope that Vietnam want to get these fields developed because currently they use a hell of a lot of coal. And so it'd be good for them and for the world if they were to start using gas instead of coal. And with the coal price having risen strongly this year, you would hope that that has focused minds. And moving on to Indonesia. So one of Jade Stone's big development plans is for the Akatara gas field, which is contained within the Limang production sharing contract area. And they acquired it for 16 and a half million in 2020 and have since bought out the minority interests. So they own 100%. So the field produced oil for three years to 2019, but they will now be aiming to produce gas and they reckon their resources, two sea resources of 55 billion cubic feet of gas, 2.2 million barrels of liquids and 5.8 million barrels of liquid petroleum gas. And the field life is expected to be around six years. Um, final investments decision expected in the second half of this year with first production in H1 2024 and development is expected to cost 94 million. So these are their plans. So everything has been delayed. Sanction is now expected in H2 2022. The 1st of December 2021, they announced the signing of an offtake agreement for the gas with the National Electricity Company, I believe. And that would that was at a price of $5.6 per million BTU, British Thermal U Unit. And you'll see that is a long way from spot gas prices. So this will be fixed contract and Jade Stone will not be exposed to the vagaries of the spot market. Okay, let's go through their latest presentation. So production guidance for 2022 is 15 and a half to 18 and a half thousand barrels a day with upside in the second half when the stag infill drilling campaign gets underway. OPEX 23 to 28 um, dollars a barrel excluding workovers and capex 90 to 105 million um, that includes initial development on the mag now currently we'll go through this dividends payments are really quite low given the cash resources and income of the company but in the recent webinar paul blakely raised the possibility of higher payouts should oil prices remain high. So infill drilling on STAG is penciled in for Q3. There'll be a slight decrease in OPEX this year, mainly just due to higher production. And this is the breakdown of CapEx. Most of it is going to be spent on STAG wells, infill wells, and then most of the remainder on development of Le Mang. So this is the work program for the coming few years. This year, there will be maintenance at Montara, Stag and Malaysia, which will reduce production for a period. Then um, later in the year, we have infill drilling at Stag 
And then in 2024, we have infill drilling at Montara and late next year, infill drilling in East Bellamut. But the big um, projects for Jade Stone the next year is Le Mang. Final investment decision and then the development of their field aiming for first gas H1 2024. And then the Vietnamese fields essentially are waiting on government approval. Okay, so Jade Stone has mainly grown through inorganic acquisitions and the recent addition of Malaysian assets last year is a very good example of that, adding 6,000 barrels a day and essentially getting paid for doing so. Absolutely amazing. Well, what are the uh, prospects for further deals? Well, in the uh, most recent webinar, Jay Stone said it was seeing an increasing number of opportunities as large operators aim to divest assets for ESG and other purposes. And the quality of those assets is improving. In the past year, the company had participated in 10 sales processes and was currently in six data rooms. So I would personally have thought that the high oil prices would make people want to hang on to assets. But Paul Blakely is saying the opposite. And he's saying that they're seeing a lot of opportunities. So they have the funds and the expertise to execute should they find any assets they like. And he's saying it's an exciting time for the company. So watch this space. And let's go through the management. So this is the board, Paul Blakely, CEO, and then Dennis McShane, independent non-executive director and chairman, and Robert Land Lambert. Let's go through them. So this is Paul Blakely. His LinkedIn says he's president and CEO. What's the difference? What does the president do? Don't know. And Paul has been in the industry a long time. So he's been in the industry, I reckon, 45 years since starting in Schlumberger. And he's proper old school, which is good and bad. The good thing is he's really experienced, but the bad, I think, is that actually he just wants to get on with the job and he's not terribly great at PR. And when you look into the details of the presentations and you listen to him uh, talk, actually there, there isn't that much detail. So, for example, the STAG campaign infill drilling, how much is that going to boost production? Nowhere is that stated. But anyway, look through this. If you're interested, he is very experienced, having run Talisman's Energies Asia Pacific for five years. Prior to that, he was at Arco BP, Sun Oil, and then earlier Shell. Who were Talisman Energy? Well, Talisman Energy actually came out of BP. BP spun off BP Canada as a separate listing. Then Talisman went on a aggressive acquisition campaign and grew to be one of the largest Canadian independents with assets in North America, North Sea and Southeast Asia. They were acquired in 2015 for 13.1 billion by Repsol. Okay, what about Dennis McShane, chairman? Well, he is a finance guy coming out of JP Morgan. And previously, he was independent director at Offair. Now, Offair, I, was, I remember I had a shareholding in and is not a great story. So this is the share price history of Offair. And essentially, they discovered the Fortuna gas field offshore Equatorial Guinea back in 2008. And then in 2012, they did a three well, three well appraisal drilling campaign, which was a great success and the share price shot up. But then essentially they spent the following years attempting to raise money for the development and failing. A big blow was when Schlumberger pulled out in 2016. 
and ultimately lost the license in 2018, having failed to secure funding. And the off-air share price reminds me very much of the accuracy, the life cycle of a mineral discovery chart. So essentially, the share price of Ophir shot up on speculation once they'd made the discovery and appraisal. And then the share price drifted off as they attempted to develop it and failed. So once again, sell on exploration success because development takes time and money and is uns of uncertain success. What about Robert Lambert, deputy chairman and non-exec? Well, he's been in the industry for 44 years and is now a uh, non-exec of various oil companies. So a very experienced board. And okay, let's do a calculation. So using guidance of 15,500 to 18,500 barrels of oil per day for 2022, 95% oil. We're going to assume 100% oil and mid range, so 17,000 barrels a day. OPEX at the top of the range. So we're going to be conservative, $28, barrel, $28 a barrel. CapEx, um, 105. An average oil price, $100. So bear in mind that oil price Brent is currently at, I believe, 100, best part of 110, and that main Australian fields produce oil at a premium to Brent. So we're going to assume oil at 100. Um, and we're also going to assume the tax rate is 45% equal to 2019 tax rate. I'll make my calculation spreadsheet available if you're interested on the Discord. But I calculate profits for the coming year are around 153 million, free cash for 140. And that puts the company on a P ratio of about four, cash flow yield of 24%. But Uncool Tom on our Discord has done a more detailed spreadsheet and he comes up with profit off tax of 140 million free cash for 138 so similar ballpark p ratio about 4.3 cash flow yield of 23 percent one crucial difference between the two is jade stone do not include the cost of workovers in their opex and he has allowed 15 million I believe, for workovers. So because his PE ratio is slightly higher, i.e. conservative, we'll use his numbers. Okay, in addition, what is the status of Maori? If the New Zealand gov government finally gives the go-ahead for Jade Stone to take over Maori, what will be the financial implications? Now, I think that based on the numbers provided by Jade Stone, that OMV will then owe them around 25 million because the effective date was the 1st of January 2019. And so they will be getting the profits from Mari from that period onwards, minus the 50 million cost of the acquisition. Bear in mind that they're only acquiring 69% of the field. Okay, dividends. Well, they pay a dividend, but frankly, a really mean one. Its um, last interim was in September. They paid out 0.43p a share. Share price currently 100p. Um, and the final dividend is normally twice the interim. So expecting a final dividend in June of around uh, 0.9p a share, which would give the um, shares a yield of 1.35%. Essentially, they have lots of uses for the cash, or they should do. Infill drilling opportunities, development of Akatara, and 
potentially other acquisitions. So dividends are not the highest priority, but Paul Blakely did raise the possibility of further payouts later this year should oil prices remain high. Okay, finally, moving on to positives and negatives. Well, I really like the management in this company, and actually it's one of my top 10 positions, primarily because the um, management is old school and competent and understands what investors are looking for in an oil company, i.e. they haven't hedged at all. So they're exposed, fully exposed to very high oil and gas prices. Production is growing. We've got a cash pile of 117 million as of the end of 2021. We're on the hunt for further acquisitions. And their track record with acquisitions is, um, is really good. I mean, Malaysian assets, they acquired essentially, they were paid to take them. Amazing. And should fi they finally get uh, approval to take over Mari, they will get more production, which will take them over 20,000 barrels a day. And they'll also receive around 25 million in cash, I estimate. The P ratio is roughly about 4.3 at $100 a barrel. Um, and production is rising. They've got the prospect of both the Indonesian gas fields coming online, hopefully in early 2024. And if they can get approval for the Vietnamese gas fields, those are big. Negatives. Well, as we've seen, they're a bit of a motley collection of late and midlife assets, some of which, like Montara with its um, oil spill, have a checkered history. Uh, we've no idea when Mari will be approved, or frankly, if it will be approved. The Na Nam Du and Yu Min, there's no time scale for Vietnamese government to approve those. And those are big fields. If they were not to be approved, that would take away quite a lot of potential upside. Um, the Akatara development is at a fixed price contract of $5.6 with BTU, which is way below spot prices of over 30. So we don't really know the economics of that field. And although Paul Blakely is saying he's seeing lots of opportunities, I wonder whether the price of those opportunities has risen and will he be able to get the same sort of deals he got at the COVID lows? You would think not. We can but wait and see. But above all, I think we are late cycle now. Rising oil price tends to kill the world economy. And with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we could now see a structural supply deficit in oil develop, causing the oil price to rise to the point it kills the world economy. So should you be buying Jade Stone now or frankly waiting until the bottom of the next cycle and then getting involved? But in summary, I like Jade Stone. It's a kind of scavenger, which uh, is very well run. And it's got lots of organic and inorganic, hopefully, uh, growth opportunities. And above all, it is completely unhedged. So that's it. Please can you press like and subscribe to the channel if you are watching Portfolio Matters for the first time. Our main output is the weekly review of markets and the macro economy. And please check out our latest episode. Once again, thank you to Uncool Tom in particular and other members of our Discord channel for helping me put all this together. And in the meantime, it is goodbye from me, Keith Jordan. Goodbye. Full disclaimer. The material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, 
we make no representations or warranties of any kind, express or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from the use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.